Thank you, Christian, and thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, if I can have the first slide, please. Uh, what I'm going to share with you here is uh, information from UEFA Elite Club Injury Study, as Christian mentioned. This is a study that started uh, 2001 when UEFA decided to invite the best football teams in Europe to send data and participate in a study. And as you can see from this slide, all the best teams in Europe participate. We have from, from Italy, Juventus, Roma, Milan, Inter, Napoli, uh, etc. They send us data every month, and some of the teams have done that for 16 years now. We have the largest database in the world in male elite football players with about 24,000 injuries. We are going to talk about muscle injuries today, and we have about 8,000 muscle injuries in the database. So I'm going to share with you some of, of the results from, from this study. I'm mainly going to talk about the Munich consensus statement about muscle injuries and classification. The question is, why? Why, why is the consensus done? What's the reason for having a consensus? The reason is that muscle injuries is so different. There could be a difference between uh, um, injuries causing absence one to two days or one to two training sessions and injuries causing absence for many months. So if we want to treat these injuries well and predict the, the return to play, we must classify them and compare um, apples to apples and so on. So that's the reason why we had a consensus meeting. We had it with a group of experts in Munich uh, several years ago, and, and the definition of a muscle injury which we use in our injury study is that it's a traumatic distraction or an overuse injury to the muscle leading to a player being unable to fully participate in training or match play. So it's a time loss definition. It's one third of all injuries. It's the absolute greatest problem in elite football, uh, muscle injuries. Now, uh, first of all, the major thing you have to uh, differentiate is between direct and indirect muscle injuries. The direct are the contusions. They don't cause any problems in general. They are few, it's only 12% of all muscle injuries, and they have a short absence in, in, in average about a week. The big problem are, as you know, the indirect muscle injuries, that 88% of all muscle injuries, they call an, cause an average absence of about 18 days, but with a huge differentiation. So that's why we need a classification to be better in, in predicting return to play, for example. Now, the good thing with the, with the Munich consensus system is that it, it defined a new definition of two types of muscle injury, the structural injuries and the functional injuries. The structural injuries are tears, partial or total. The functional muscle disorders are all the other injuries, not tears visible on ultrasound on an MRI. So this is a, a great uh, separation about two big groups of injuries. Now, you could call that in, in Elite, in male elite football, almost all injuries affect four muscle groups. It's the hamstring, the most common, the hip and groin, the quadricep, and the calf. So it's very uncommon with muscle injuries in other muscles in football. Uh, if we look at the most common injury in football, the real problem in elite football are the hamstring injuries. It's about 12% of all injuries in total. And a team which normally has about a squad of about 25 to 30 players, they can expect five to six hamstring injuries each season. It means about a total loss for the team, about 80 days for the squad. And since we know that an average, what an average injury costs at this level, a player in Juventus, 
that is injured for one month causes the cost for the club about 500,000 euros. So 80 days of injuries in Juventus or Inter or Roma is a cost for the club with about one and a half million US dollar. It's a lot of economy as well. What about development of injuries? Are we successful in preventing them? Unfortunately not. Here you can see the, the trend over 15 years. And as you can see, in spite of all the efforts done on the field to prevent injuries, the injury risk is increasing for hamstring injuries year by year, every year by about, about 4%. This is surprising because we know that our preventive method that had been so effective on elite level and, and amateur level. So maybe these existing methods are not enough on elite level. We can only see the effect that the injury risk is increasing. We do not know why. There could be several other reasons. One very probable reason is that the, the, the play has changed during the 15 years. You know, hamstring injuries is the sprinting injury. And the studies have shown that the, the intensity of the play has increased a lot during the last 15 years. So the, the, the number of high, uh, uh, high speed running and so on, about 30% increase. So it could be that the, the reason for the rise is the change of the play. But if it is so, more than ever a reason to work harder with prevention of hamstring injuries at the elite level. Now, another reason, we have, uh, we have our chairman here uh, uh, and Roald Bar in Norway, they have done excellent studies showing that, in randomized studies, showing that if you use, for example, ham Nordic hamstrings, you can reduce injuries, uh, and that is the very effective amateur level. Why don't we see the same situation in elite level? One reason that we, we, we made a questionnaire a couple of uh, years ago and asked the teams at the elite level, and it showed that they don't use the methods that we have shown are effective. Only 16% used the, the evidence-based um, injury prevention program. So obviously there might be a reason for this. It could be implementation problem. Or it might be that they don't believe that it's effective. Uh, we don't know the reason for this. But obviously, here's a problem. Another problem is that at elite level, with Juventus and Roma, so they play so many matches with such short restitution between, so they get fatigued in the muscle. And that is also probably a reason why we have a, an increasing tendency of, of hamstring injuries. Uh, a question, how, how many of you have treated a, a muscle in your wi within the last three months? Could you raise your hands? Raise your hands higher. So, the majority. Now, I'm sure you all have the same question as all, when it comes to all uh, sports injuries. When can the athlete go back? When can he or she return to play? That's the question you get from the player, the manager, the media, the agent, everybody. So we, with 24,000 injuries in a database, we have pretty safe return to play data because we have so robust data because uh, it, it's, it, it's 24,000 injuries or, or 8,000 muscle injuries. So if you look at this picture, it's the four most common location, as I mentioned. If we look at days of absence and percentage of re injuries which are key data, you could see that there's, there's no difference. It's the same for hamstrings, adductors, quadriceps, and calf. It's the same amount of re injuries It could be because they're all treated in the same way, but obviously, uh, location is not predictive for absence. And the reason is that within these injuries, for example, hamsters, there are many sorts of injuries, so it's a large variation. Uh, 
the, out on the field, we visit teams all the time, so we have visited all the best teams. There's always the same question about uh, um, muscle injuries. What use could we have of imaging? What information does MRI or ultrasound give us? And, and we made a test and say, what's the use of imaging on elite level? And here you, uh, so we followed almost 1,500 hamstring injuries on, during seven years. I can tell you, clinical examination is the basis. That's very important to learn. Clinical examination is the basis. All injuries were examined clinically. That's the basis. But as you can see here, 86% of all injuries also had an, some sort of imaging, MRI or ultrasound. Only 40% did, did only trust their hands and, and, and the clinical examination. This probably means that the, the, the medical teams out in the elite team, they believe that they get something out of, of the imaging. So let's see, what can they get out of imaging? Uh, we did a study about that, which is published in uh, BGSM, and by the way, having the editor on BGSM on, on the first line, I can say that this is the, the sports medicine journal now. We send all our papers uh, uh, to British Journal of Sports Medicine. It has an impact over six, and it's clinically oriented. So if you, if you should, um, and it's, a, it's an advantage for your, your international and natural society that you have a correlation with BGSM so you can read it, that's very clever. And, and, um, and this is a recommendation, read first in BGSM and you get the best information. What we did here was that we, eval we evaluated the imaging, the radiology, the radiologists, they have a very good uh, classification of system. They call hamstring injuries grade, um, grade zero if it's a normal MRI or ultrasound, no pathology. Grade one is edema but no tears. Grade two is partial ruptures or partial tears, and grade three are total ruptures. What you can see from this picture is that it's very common with grade zero and grade one. Very uncommon at the elite level with total ruptures. So actually, you could see here that 7% of all injuries seen in the elite football teams are not ruptures. We sometimes call muscle injuries, we say muscle ruptures. Well, 70% seen on the sports field are not ruptures. Still, they cause the majority of absence. This is the problem on the field. So, but then you could look upon injuries in different, with different eyes, depending on if you're working on the field or if you're working in a hospital. On the field, you see the minor injuries. You, you never, you very seldom that you have to refer any injuries to the hospital. You treat them all yourself. Total ruptures are very unusual or, or unusual. In the hospital, in contrast, you see all the severe injuries. You see the total ruptures. When I speak about these muscle injuries in football, I always get the question from the audience, what type of surgery do you do? I say, what surgery? I have, we have worked 17 years. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I have done surgeries also in muscle injuries. But it's not a problem on the elite level. During 17 years of studies with, uh, 20, with 50 elite club teams in Europe, we have seen less than 10 uh, surgeries. So this is a not, a, it might be a problem in the hospital, it's not a problem on the sports field. Uh, is there a correlation between uh, Radio radiological finding and absence. Yes, there is definitely a correlation between grading of injuries, the severity of injuries, and, and absence. As you can see here, it's, it's really clearly significant. Uh, if you want to know more about 
exact prediction of India's return to play, you should ask Anna, who is sitting here on the first row. She wrote an article about return to play following muscle injuries in professional football, uh, which, uh, which was not published in British Journal of Sports Medicine, but in Journal of Sports Science, which is now uh, um, also called Football uh, Science. Um, as you can see here, if you look at hamstring injuries, you could see that grade zero injuries, if they don't have any pathology, they are normally back within a week. Uh, and, they have a, uh, and if they have grade one, which is edema, no tear, it takes between two and three weeks. If they have grade two, partial tear, it's, uh, it's about uh, between three and four weeks. In grade three, the total rupture is uh, often uh, months. But look at this picture again. Anna has shown something which is very important for you working in practical. You normally refer injuries to, to the mean. But as you can see, the variation is very large. The standard deviation is very large. We recommend that you look at the median value. That's the most common. And that's where the value you have uh, is mo uh, most valuable for you wanting to see what is the clearly the practical expected return to play. Uh, we did a further specification. We said, okay, what, what, what more information could we get out of imaging? And we then evaluated grade one and two. Of course, we could not evaluate grade zero because they had no pathology, and we could not use grade three because there was a few. So we compared grade one and grade two. Uh, what we found is, and the question is, is the size of the pathology, the edema, is that correlated to abscess? Yes, it is. It's rather strong for grade one injuries and not so strong for grade two injuries. That has been shown in other studies, so that's, that's not really anything new. What about the location of muscle? And we separated between proximal, mid, uh, middle, and distal. When it comes to grade one and grade two injuries, as you can see here, we did not find any, any uh, uh, difference between uh, the location in this material with these type of injuries seen on, on the football field. What about the, 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 the intramuscular location of injuries? If you are in English literature, in English radiologists, they love to, to separate, they say it's to typing the injuries. They say it's an MT junction, where, which is an injury located as the muscle tendinous junction. They say the muscle type, which is an injury within the muscle but not connected to the tendon. The fascial is one at the, at the, at the surface, at the fascia, and the myofascial is close to the surface. And they, they really always say it's a grade two myotendinous junction injury. The question is, if you look at the literature, there's no evidence at all that this type of typing the intramuscular muscle has any correlation with, with uh, predicting or return to play. We couldn't find any uh, difference either. So this is something we'd commonly used among radiologists with no evidence of giving any uh, specific information. What about then if we go deeper and say within the hamstring muscles, which of the hamstring muscles does uh, uh, the injury occur? Well, uh, we showed that bicep femoris is most commonly injured. That's shown in several other studies. Semitendinosus and semimembranosus are not so common. But if you look at the absence days, there's no difference. The question is, what's the reason for this? Probably, but because I think, and Carl might probably uh, give comments on that, I think they are treated in a similar way in the elite clubs, but I, I don't know for sure. But we, the absence data were no different. However, the re injury rate was significantly di uh, um, different. There's a much higher risk of re injury in biceps femoris injuries and significantly less on. Se injuries to semitendinosus and semimembranosus. This might have a practical influence for you 
because if you have a bicep femoris injury, be careful. Maybe it's better to be safe than quick. Maybe keep them a little longer on rehabilitation to avoid re injuries. If you have an injury to semimembranosis and semitendinosis, maybe you can force them a, a, a little. So the take home message uh, for me is I've talked a lot about imaging, but be sure that the clinical examination is the basis for prognosticating a return to play. Secondly, imaging is valuable for, for prognosticating return to play, at least at elite level. And radiological grading and the size of edema are, at least at elite level, associated with layoff times after injury. If you want to follow the front line of football medicine, be on Twitter because that's where you get the information fastest and quickest and uh, because it takes some time before uh, articles are published. Thank you very much for listening.